This is the Cubs-related podcast presented by CubsInsider.com. My name is Corey. I am joined, as always, by Brendan. And ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts. If you were not already on board the hype train, welcome to it. I will be your conductor for the evening. And in those duties, (laughs) allow me to introduce you to the first place in the National League Central, the best winning percentage in the National League. Ladies and gentlemen, your Chicago Cubs. Brendan, that was amazing. The Cubs sweep the St. Louis Cardinals out of Wrigley Field for about the last four innings on Sunday Night Baseball on the national stage, folks. The Cardinals had to stand in the field while the Cubs' offense demoralized them, put the nail in the coffin on the sweep, and the 40,000-plus Wrigley Field faithful let it ring out. Sweet, sweet, sweet. And here we are. You, know, you look back on some of these seasons and years past, and you remember certain games. You remember certain series. Like, like for example, in 2015, you remember KB's walk-off against Colorado. It was kind of like turning points. In 2007, you remember Aramis Ramirez's walk-off against Milwaukee as turning points. This is one of those games and series, really, you look back and you're like, you know what? That That was it. And so for the Cubs to be 19 and 12, Corey, for the bullpen Amazing. to have the best ERA in Major League Baseball since April 7th, for the, for the rotation to do what they're doing recently and having one of the best overall staffs, honestly, in the past four weeks, combining that with this offense, Corey, honestly, who is better than this team right now? I mean, the stats show it. I think really the the ceiling and the potential for the team is even higher than what they're currently playing at right now. Let's go, Corey. Let's go. Absolutely, brother. The Cubs, as you said, are 19 and 12. They have won seven straight games after completing the sweep of the St. Louis Cardinals. And as we've been looking at for the last few weeks here, let me just run through the series results after that series with Milwaukee. So again, the Cubs are 19 and 12 after starting 1 and 6, then going to 2 and 7. 19 and 12. That is an unbelievable turnaround for this team to now be in sole possession of first place on May 5th. One month they go from dead last in the division to first place. And here is how they did it after that Milwaukee series. They take two of three from the Pittsburgh Pirates. The only series that they have not won since that Pittsburgh series is a split with the Anaheim Angels at Wrigley Field, the Sunday game getting weathered out. They take one of two in that one. They then sweep the Miami Marlins. They take two of three from the Arizona Diamondbacks, two of three from the LA Dodgers, two of three again from the Arizona Diamondbacks. They sweep a two-game set in Seattle, and they sweep, let's say it again, they sweep Sweep. in very not boring fashion, I must add, Brendan. It was very exciting uh, from our perspective. The St. Louis Cardinals out of Wrigley Field. Thanks for coming. Take a seat, Yachty. Get out of here. Unbelievable, (laughs) Brendan. And I am going to run through these box scores There is an awful lot to break down, just some amazing performances by the Cubs this weekend, stats to dig into, and we will. So I am going to just get through these box scores, pitcher lines, how the Cubs score, just to, you know, set the stage for everything. And we're going to do our best not to break in, because if we did, we would ultimately end the podcast once we got through the box scores, because there's just so much to talk about. So I'm going to try to control myself, but bear with me here. So on Friday... Uh, This was the Kyle Hendricks show, and that's pretty much all there is to say about it. Kyle Hendricks throws an 81-pitch complete game shutout on Friday. The game takes uh, about two hours and 28 minutes. I will repeat that again. Don't adjust your radios or your earphones, however you're listening to this. 81 pitches for a complete game shutout of this St. Louis Cardinals offense. The final line for Kyle Hendricks, that would be nine innings pitched, four hits, no runs, no walks, three strikeouts. This was 
No hyperbole from me. One of the best pitching performances I have ever seen. And I said multiple times to Brendan and my brother, who I was watching the game with, that I literally could not believe what I was watching uh, with where his pitch count was and just how quickly (laughs) he was was getting through this. It was absolutely unbelievable to watch Kyle Hendricks on Friday. The Cubs getting their runs in this one on an Anthony Rizzo home run in the bottom of the third. That was a three-run shot, number eight for Tony on the year. And then in the bottom of the seventh, a Javi Baez single to bring in one Chris Bryant. That made it four to nothing. That was it. Two hours, 28 minutes. Uh, Kyle Hendricks, 81 pitches, and we're out of there with a win. So that was uh, pretty amazing. And that will be our, just for uh, clarity's sake, Kyle Hendricks will be the first thing we talk about uh, once we you know wrap up these box scores. On Saturday, the Taylor Davis game, everybody. And, you know, this is one where, again, Brennan and I will always eat crow if there is crow to be eaten by us. And we were not bullish on the Taylor Davis as the (laughs) third catcher in the Cubs hierarchy uh, before Victor Caratini went down. And, you know, not really bullish on him being the backup uh, once Caratini went down. Caratini taking batting practice today, so that's actually some good news. Uh, But we did praise the receiving, game-calling, framing that Taylor Davis did in the first start uh, with you, Darvish, in Arizona, the quality start for you. And he comes up with a massive, massive hit in this game. The Cardinals take a 5-1 to lead in this one. I am definitely not going to run through how they did that. Uh, it was not a good start for you, Darvish. Maybe we'll talk about it. I don't know. There's honestly, in, the, in, in full disclosure here, there's way too much good going on with this team for us to break down uh, another lackluster start from you, Darvish. That's just how it is. Uh, but the Cubs did have a one to nothing lead in this game on a Chris Bryant single. He had a very good series, but the best was yet to come. I'll leave that uh, uh, for a minute there. But in the top of the fourth, the Cardinals extend their lead to five to one. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning. And we've talked about this already a few times this year, Brendan, where the opposing managers make the decision to intentionally walk one member of the Cubs lineup, and they regret it for who they ultimately decided to pitch to. Michael Waka walking Kyle Schwarber intentionally to load the bases in the fourth inning. They bring up Taylor Davis, and if you go on Twitter and look for the Cardinals broadcast of this, it's another one of those chef kiss type uh, <laughs> calls and moments from, I, I don't know their, their play-by-play guy, uh, but I know that the color man is Tim McCarver. And nothing makes me happier than Tim McCarver, uh, you know, making himself sound stupid. But they spend about 30 seconds praising the decision to walk Schwarber, talking about how, you know, Taylor Davis is the backup. This is a great move, great strategy by the Cardinals. (laughs) And Taylor Davis deposits an absolute bomb. Dude, that was a missile. An absolute bomb for a grand slam, a game-tying grand slam at Wrigley Field against the St. Louis Cardinals. How about that for a story about your first major league home run? Congrats to Taylor Davis. That is a a hell of a moment. And he, you know, sounded like he enjoyed every minute of it and he deserves it. This is a guy who has worked hard and earned the opportunity that he got. And so far in, you know, both his catching and stepping up when he had an opportunity, he has made good on the opportunity that the Cubs have given him. And in the eighth inning, guess who wins this one for the Cubs, folks? None other than El Mago Javier Baez, his 11th home run of the year, another oppo shot. And this was a fun one because he hits a pop-up down the right field line that Martinez, Wong, and I think Goldschmidt converge on. Wong makes a sliding attempt. It touches his glove and bounces foul. Looked like it, you know, maybe was in fair territory, maybe on the line, whatever. They stick with the call on the field. They call it foul. 
Well, Javi gets another chance, folks, and he didn't waste it. He wins the game for the Cubs in the bottom of the eighth inning. Six to five is your final. With that, the Cubs winning the series. Brandon Kinsler picking up the win in this one uh, with a really good inning of relief. The Cubs bullpen was masterful in this game after you Darvish. Darvish's final line, four innings, six hits, five earned, five walks, four strikeouts. Following him was Alan Webster, who uh, only pitched a third of an inning and then was relieved by Kyle Ryan, Brad Brock, Steve Ciszek, Brandon Kinsler, and Pedro Strope. They go five scoreless innings, just one walk from that entire group uh, while striking out seven batters and only allowing three hits. This was a masterful job of the Cubs to overcome an early deficit with both their offense and excellent work from almost almost literally their entire bullpen coming in in this game. Uh, so that wins them the series. Strope picks up his fourth save, and we go into Sunday night. Everybody, everybody goes into their closet. They get out the broom. They're ready to go, and the Cubs blow out the St. Louis Cardinals on national TV on ESPN behind the arm of Jose Quintana and an explosive performance from the Cubs offense. Jose Quintana picking up his fourth win. He goes six innings, eight hits, two earned, two walks, and two strikeouts. Jose Quintana was very good. Again, not a a higher whiff total as we've seen with him in some of these other outings, but still a very good... The command was on point. Yes. He was just... Yeah. And a quality start for Jose once again. Brandon Kinsler came in in relief, followed by Steve Ciszek, and Tyler Chadwood would finish it out. Tyler had a a bit of a rough ride there, but look, he's throwing strikes for the most part, uh, with a huge lead, which is what you want him to do. He ended up giving up uh, some home runs, but so what? The Cubs winning this one 13-5, to ultimately the final score, and here is how they got their runs. Wilson Contreras with his ninth homer of the season. We mentioned this, I think, on the last podcast, but Wilson Contreras had 10 home runs in 2018. He is now one away from matching that total. We are recording this on May 5th, folks, so that is a good thing. In the bottom of the fifth, Jason Hayward triples, scoring Wilson Contreras. David Bodie then follows with a sack fly that made it 3 to nothing. The Cubs adding more runs in the bottom of the sixth, and Anthony Rizzo double and a Wilson Contreras single made it 6-2. to two. In the seventh, the Ben Zobrist single made it 7-2. to two. In the bottom of the eighth, boy, was the bottom of the eighth fun, folks. David Bodie with an RBI double. Made it eight to two. Albert Almora with his second double in as many inning, or excuse me, in as many at bats, uh, made it nine to two, scoring David Bodie. And then a few batters later, one Christopher Bryant steps to the plate. And I don't know, Brendan. I feel like there's a podcast out there and a blog, not that we're alone in this, uh, Bleacher Nation and, and, and those guys and a lot of others has, have been preaching this as well, but I believe there's a certain podcast that pretty much the whole year has been telling you not to worry about Chris Bryant, and uh, I'm thinking that not many people are too worried about him anymore. He launches a towering Grand Slam that was poetic, Brendan. This was the nail in the coffin. This was a bludgeon blow to the Cardinals, who were already trailing 9-2 to two at the moment. That makes it 13-2, to two, KB's fourth home run on the year. We will talk more about him in a moment as well. Like I said, the Cardinals adding some meaningless home runs. Congratulations on that, St. Louis, to make it 13-5. to five. And that is all she wrote. Like I said, for the last few innings here, the chance of sweep ringing out through the bleachers and grandstands of Wrigley Field. The crowd was hot the entire weekend. And Brendan, I'm, I'm going to throw it to you here. We're going to talk about Hendricks, you know, as kind of our, our first jumping off point, but just wrapping up like general thoughts on this series. This was an unbelievable statement from the Cubs. They went in with the ability, and, you know, and we, we kind of said in jest, like at the end of the last episode, like two or three is great. Let's do that. But, you know, why not just sweep them and take sole possession of first place uh, after I think Strasburg and the Nats beat them when the Cubs had the off day. And they do just that. And again, you know, kind of like we've seen 
in some of these other series, they do it in a few different ways, right? You get an unbelievable right. performance and a shutout from Hendricks on Friday. You get the clutch hit, couple clutch hits, uh, and an awesome performance from your bullpen, settling things down on Saturday, and then you just blow them out of the water on Sunday. I, there's almost little to say other than this was awesome. Well, I texted you this on the second game, right when the Cubs went down 5-1. And I texted you, you know, it feels like I'm not concerned. It feels as if it's like that 2016 year, like when the Cubs did go down, they had the offensive ability to come back. Whereas in 2017 and 2018, while at times the offense was good, there there were inconsistent stretches. And this year feels different. And combining that with Chris Bryant getting back on track, the offense seems more well-rounded. Not only that, but the approaches that these guys are showing, Javi going oppo, Wilson Contreras going oppo, Chris Bryant going dead center, going oppo for every homer this year, it seems like their approach is working. So that's... That's so encouraging because, again, there were times last season where the Cubs were kind of one-dimensional and they would just go on short stretches of just blowing teams out. But this year and this series against the Cardinal was kind of a microcosm of their success in 2019 is they're winning and doing everything right from a top-to-bottom approach, from one to eight in that lineup approach. And that's why I am so excited. So excited. And I we mentioned this going into the year, but the offensive potential that these guys had, right. they are reaching that yeah. right now. And they're doing that by getting better, by adapting. And that is why I think going forward in the next few months, they're still not done yet. And that's what's cool about this. They're, yeah, they're 19 and 12. They're in first place. They swept the Cardinals. Yeah, I feel great. But there is still room for improvement. And I think, I think they're going to get there. And we've we've waited for it kind of all year, and we're we're kind of starting to get it. Obviously, where in the beginning of the year it was kind of the Javi Baez, Jason Hayward, Wilson Contreras show for a lot of those early games, and here comes Brizzo joining everyone. the party, yeah. right? <laughs> and you know you've got Bodie doing his thing. Schwarber hit that huge home run in Seattle. Like it's all kind of rounding into place here. Ben Zobrist is heating up a little bit with the slow start he had. He made some great plays in the field tonight. 37 years old. He looks like uh, 25 out there. But very swift. Just, yeah, it's, it's all coming together. And I agree with you. Like this team is playing really well. I don't think they've played their best baseball yet. And, and it's, it's very exciting. This, this team just has that feel about them where we we just knew going into the year that they had the talent despite you know the the lack of activity in the off season and you know Pakoda the 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 people that run those uh, <laughs> prediction models are very scared at the moment watching the Chicago Cubs right now uh but you know we we talked about how even with the inactivity in the off season and you know everybody wanted Bryce Harper that whole thing like the the talent that this team had could match anybody and i remember kind of railing home the point in in some of those off season episodes that they they could have added some stuff they could have done things differently in the off season but this notion that that people think this is a basement dwelling like worse than the Pirates and Reds team was absurd. And you are seeing why we kind of railed on that point because this team is so talented. And when they put right. it all together, even most of it together, they are really, really good. And they are showing that right now. But I want to turn to Kyle Hendricks. And Let's do it. this was absurd, Brendan. Like I said, he throws an 81-pitch complete game shutout. And this is not, you know, no offense to the Marlins who come in next. Like, this is not against the Marlins lineup. Like, this is against a Cardinals lineup that is really good top to bottom and had some guys, you know, that were on real streaks uh, coming into this. And again, they, they, they call it a Maddox, which is a complete game shutout in less than 100 pitches. And for a, a moment there in the ninth inning, you're looking at this going, is he going to do this in under 80 pitches? It was only that right. last at bat to Paul DeJong that put it over the 80 pitch threshold. And he was very close to not getting there. 
it was just amazing. And it was the first Maddox uh, of that ilk since Carlos Zambrano did it in 2009. And I'm looking at this article from Jordan Bastian of MLB.com where he says that only John Lieber, I don't know how often John Lieber gets a name drop on this podcast. I like John Yeah, Lieber. let's get it I in like there. Him. Yeah. And he says that only John Lieber did it in fewer pitches in a shutout in recorded Cubs history. John Lieber did it on 78 pitches on May 24th, 2001. I remember that game very well, Brendan. Uh, no, I don't. But what was I, like 10? So no, no, I right. don't. But uh, I was probably pretty excited about it. But there's so many little things about this that were just incredible. And I think the one that that is going to stick with me the most, Kyle Hendricks threw 18 balls in this game. And that was something that John Lester pointed to uh, after the game. He said, like, the more impressive thing to me is not even the 81 pitches. It's that he only threw 18 balls the entire game. That's two balls an inning. That's absurd. Totally absurd. And I really loved a Preston Wilson tweet, actually, he was responding to the, you know, some highlights of Hendricks that he saw on Twitter. Obviously, Preston, a former Major League Baseball player, a good hitter in his time. And he said that it was Maddox-like and everything was hittable, but it was always just off barrel. And then he said, the most comfortable 0 for 4s I ever had, speaking of when he used to face Maddox. And I just thought that was a good way of putting it because that is kind of Kyle Hendricks in a nutshell. And the Cardinals made the decision uh, seemingly uh, intentionally to be aggressive and try to make early contact, jump on things, sit on a pitch and go for it. And this is where that strategy kind of backfires on you with Kyle Hendricks. We we see games where he gets a lot of whiffs and, and the strikeout totals are high, where he's changing speeds and eye levels. And this was kind of a different version of what Kyle Hendricks does so well. And this is where his tunneling and his ability to make those pitches look exactly the same until that last second really comes into play because you can tell that you have a lot of guys in that Cardinals lineup you know, for example, saying, okay, I'm sitting fastball here. They think they've got a fastball. So they're committed to the swing. It wasn't a fastball. It was a 70, you know, (laughs) 78 mile an hour changeup. And now you've just made terrible contact. And it was pretty much like that the whole game. And, you know, you look at some of those swings, like Carpenter just popping it up on the infield, these, these weak ground balls. And there were certainly some hard contact in that game. Uh, Chris Bryant made some nice plays on defense. I think Zobris made a nice play. Hayward made some nice plays. Javi, of course, is, you know, do I even need to clarify that Javi made good defensive plays in a particular game? Probably not. But it, it wasn't, you know, as if it was only soft contact from Hendricks. But I, I just like that quote from Preston Wilson because I thought that it, 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 really articulates what Hendricks was doing in that game and why it's kind of different from some of those other games that we see from Kyle Hendricks. You you sit on pitches, you think you've got it, and you're being aggressive, but what results is you make a lot of contact, but that isn't good contact. And obviously, right. that's exactly what Hendricks wants you to do. Uh, that's what yeah. he's thinking out there. How do I get these guys convinced that they are about to barrel this ball up and it's going to be just a tick off and I'm going to let my defense do work and, you know, scoop up those outs and we're going to get out of here in literally two hours and 20 minutes. So, Brendan, I I know you were kind of marveling at this start uh, just as much as I was and, you know, assuredly Kyle Hendricks uh, shows basically no emotion uh, you know, when doing it, he kind of, he gives Willie a hug, but, uh, that's, that's about the extent of it. But this was incredible, Brendan. I mean, okay. So it, it's funny that you mentioned the, the Maddox thing where the pitches are just off barrel a little bit. So I went, I was curious. I'm like, okay, I went to go back and look. I wanted to see comparing his sinker, where he's throwing it from most of the season to his very most recent start against the Cardinals. And it looked as if he was throwing his sinkers more so right in on the hands to right-handed batters. I mean, like literally on the black, right where their knuckles are. And in every start, I mean, literally, Corey, every single start before that, the approach was opposite. It was throwing sinkers off the plate, off the edge, away 
from right-handed hitters. So it was an approach change. And I'm, you know, if you look at Kyle Hendricks' first inning, and it's been kind of a narrative for a few years now, and his first inning, he always kind of gets, not always, but when he does give up runs, it's in those first few innings. And there's always a question of like, why is that happening? Why is he doing that? And maybe for, for batters, they're just jumping on him right away. Maybe he's predictable, whatever it is. That's what's going on. And I don't know if Kyle and Tommy Hadovy and the coaches knew. I mean, I'm sure they, they're aware of everything, but I wonder if their approach against, against the Cardinals was a response just to the league. And they probably thought, you know what? Okay. Look, if they're pitching, if the scouting report is that you're throwing on the outside edge portion of the plate, we're going to go right in on your hands. And you saw that, like the Cardinals got behind very quickly. Because they were only lasting like two or three pitches per at bat before you know it. Like I went away. I swear to God, Corey, I went away for what seemed like 15 minutes in the third inning. I came back. It was like the seventh inning. I'm thinking to myself, did I miss something? What is, what is going on here? And that's what I think it really was. It was Hendrick's ability to adapt and to throw strikes and to get ahead of the curve. With no pun intended, but kind of quite literally, he he really utilized that curveball too on some first pitches. He kept things off balance for these cardinal hitters, and they they were aggressive. He took advantage of that aggression, and that's what happened. I I can't remember even that big Z start. What was it, two thousand nine? I don't remember yeah. that start. I mean, I don't know if I just have a bad memory, but I just don't remember that start. This was the fastest, most efficient start. I personally remember, I think, in in my life following the Cubs, 81 pitches. Are you kidding, Corey? I mean, that is insane. This it's we've seen this before, especially with Hendricks, where again, it's not as though it was only weak contact. The Cardinals hit some balls well, but that's when this Cubs team is at their best, when they combine the good pitching and a lot of weak contact from Hendricks, but also with letting the defense do their thing, letting a, you know, what, five-time gold lover in Jason Hayward do his thing out there, letting Javi do his thing, KB doing his thing. You know, you're getting a, a production there from Zobrist as well, but that is when this team is at their best, when they are able to combine the good pitching, and let the guys behind them do the rest of the work. That is when this team is at their best. This was really incredible. And yeah. uh, I, I, you know, I don't know that there's that much more to say about it. I mean, certainly, you know, going forward, you don't always want to rely on, you know, getting all of the outs via contact, right? But like, yeah, he gave up a lot of contact, but he's throwing strikes. And that that seemed right. intentional. It seemed, because I'm telling you, Corey, I'll show you these pictures. But for him to basically throw almost exclusively in on the hands to righties, there's a reason for that. So even though the defense made some good quality plays, they were never, you know, far in the gap or even had a sniff of, of really leaving the yard. So, yes, I mean, there's some hard hit batted balls, but that was intentional. And I think that's 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 where Hendricks comes kind of sneaky in, into a lot of these opponents' head because he can keep yeah. these guys off guard. And I always compare him to Granky in that respect in that he'll switch it up. And he has no problem switching it up, whether it's using his four-seamer, two-seamer curveball and kind of going and flipping the script. And I think... Sure, like you want to see more whiffs, but he did this intentionally, and he got the result he wanted, you know? Yeah, and he was quoted after the game saying, I didn't know the exact number, but I knew it was low of his <laughs> pitch count, and then going on to say, also, Willie and I did a really good job of recognizing how aggressive they were early exactly. even to start the That's game. That's what I'm saying, yeah. So once we made good pitches within the first two of the at-bat, they over, kept being yeah. aggressive, and we were just able to take advantage. Yeah. That's it. That's uh, that's, it. that's really who Kyle Hendricks is. Like there, there's there's different kind of versions of him that you may see from time to time, and this is one of them. If guys are going to be aggressive, he's going to try to get you to keep making contact that you wish you hadn't made, and that's kind of uh, Kyle Hendricks in a nutshell there. But this was, I mean, especially on a Friday when the Cubs play at Wrigley Field and it's a day game, and you know you're going to have that the rest of Friday, the the you know the late afternoon and the evening. There's nothing better than the Cubs wrapping up a quick, 
you know, like kind of easy-ish, I guess, uh, victory. And, you know, you just get to like linger in that feeling for the rest of your Friday. Uh, it's I, honestly like that in particular is one of my favorite Cubs things, like even since I was growing up, like when they win on Friday afternoon, I know, and it's already Friday, right? So like that, you know, it's a you're starting with a good thing. It's Friday. You just maximize and that good mood, you know. It just yeah, gets you it just, right it into just the it, yeah. You just stay in that mood the whole day. It, yeah. It's great. But yeah. I do want to there, there's there's kind of a number of uh, directions I suppose we could go here. Uh, but I would like to talk about Chris Bryant, uh, Brendan. I, I would suppose too, you could. Corey. Yeah, we could we could alter that, but. The we've been preaching, you know, that his exit velocity has been really good. We have maintained uh, that he has been healthy, and that even you know when he was struggling early, like don't worry about the shoulder; his shoulder's fine. He's fine. It'll it'll get cooking, and it has. And you know, he's only got four home runs uh, so far, uh, but he's already driven in nineteen runs, and these numbers are rising, folks, rapidly. He now, after Sunday's game, has a 361 WOBA and a 125 WRC+, plus. again, 100 being league average. And just so you have a frame of reference, in 2015, KB was at a 136 WRC+, plus. 2016, when he won the MVP uh, in helping the Cubs go on to win the World Series in 2016. Mm, yes, yep, yep. He had a 148 WRC+, plus, 146 in 2017, even with the shoulder issues in 2018, it was 125, so still well above league average. So again, he's at 125 after this uh, this game on Sunday night, and the OPS is getting back up there. His OPS is now at 830, leaving this game. I'm adding this, I'm looking at the on-base percentage and slugging and adding them together. You guys know I'm not so good with math, we so uh, you may want to double check that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I have that right. And the, the, the two things that I really want to draw your attention to, uh, because we've seen the exit velocity and the hard contact ramp up. We've seen him ripping the balls, uh, you know, down the line, pulling those hard line drives into the outfield that are kind of like those classic KB singles, doubles, you know, depending on where, uh, the defenders are. But the thing I want to draw your attention to as we continue to maintain that obviously, you know, with the grand slam tonight, the power is coming. It will be there right now. If the season ended, Chris Bryant would have the highest walk rate of his career Hmm. at 14.6%, and he would also have the lowest K rate of his career at 18.2%. So we have seen all these numbers tick up. His batting average is back to 243, which is nowhere near where you would expect it to be for him, but it's creeping back up. And these peripherals around what he's doing are some of the best of his career. So as he keeps trending up, his exit velocity is doing what it's doing. He's hitting the ball out of the ballpark. If you combine it with this other stuff, it's very possible, Brendan, that we are looking at perhaps (laughs) the best version of Chris Bryant that we've seen. And look, he hits, what, 39 homers in 2016? So I'm not, you know, going to put him at 40 home runs or anything like that. We'll see how the season develops. But I'm just saying, like... That's coming. We're seeing it coming. If you've even just, you know, from an eye test been watching these games, you know Chris Bryant is ripping the ball. He's been hitting the ball harder. But when you look at these peripherals, it's difficult to not look at them and go, uh, like, this is pretty exciting what's happening right now for KB. And going into this game, uh, the Sunday game, Chris Bryant's expected weighted on base average was 385 okay so even in that 2016 season when he won MVP his expected weighted on base average was 388 so it's essentially the same and the numbers don't necessarily show how good Chris Bryant has been in the last few weeks we wrote about this on CubsInsider.com but a KB is trending up in <laughs> in every peripheral, whether it's contact rate, whether it's walk rate, exit velocity, launch angle, you name it, he's doing it. And now we're gonna about we're gonna see the results. And we're seeing a little bit of the results here with some of these homers recently, but there's more to come. And for Chris Bryant, you expect him to change something 
that gives him an advantage. And so far this year, it's just better plate discipline. You think the guy's done adjusting. He, he's never done. And so his outside zone swing rate is at 21% right now, Corey. That is like the same tier as what Dexter Fowler was at in 2016. That's in the same tier as the Ben Zobras, the Joey Vados, that tier. Whereas in years past, he was around 27, 28%. So he's not only is he recognizing pitches better, but now he's beginning to hit them harder, to hit them higher, and he's hitting them more often. That's a perfect storm for another MVP season. So it's crazy. It's crazy to even suggest this, but Chris Bryant and Javi Baez both are looking like the best versions of themselves. And that's, that's wild to me because going into this year, I just asked really the baseball guys. I said, you know what? Just please give me like kind of, you know, I'm not going to be too greedy and ask for the same version as Javi Baez as last year, but give me the same guy who was like a three and a half to four win player. Javi Baez is better than last year. Like, I'm, I'm convinced. I think we've, we've had a 150 plate appearance sample almost now. The peripherals look better. He looks better. He passes the eye test. Everything is trending up for Javi. And same thing with, with Chris Bryant. You're looking at possibly two MVPs on the same team. And I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not exaggerating. I genuinely believe that right now. And that's, it's, it's insane to even sit here, especially after the, after the year started with a two and seven record to come back a month later, be seven games up above 500 and have Chris Bryant and Javi Baez doing this. It's so satisfying, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, really fun to watch. That is certainly the case. And again, you know, you just, you're getting, Javi has such a knack for these big moments that it's, it's really quite astounding. Was and that, was, was that Homer a, not reminiscent of that, of that 2015 and ODS Homer, the oppo, this, the, you know, the kind of like, oh yeah, the day John light, Lackey you know? game. Oh yeah, the John Lackey game. Yeah, like I, sure. that was it, essentially what, I was reminded of when I saw that homer. I almost messaged you. I'm like, you know what? We need a side by side of that, but I didn't do it. But it was like that's what Javi does, Corey. Yeah, and there was. Uh, I want to read this tweet from Jordan Bastian again. He is the Cubs MLB.com reporter, friend of the podcast. You should be following him at ML Bastian on Twitter. And I'm just going to read this this whole tweet quote. After Darvish exited Saturday's game, he saw Baez in the batting cage and apologized for letting the team down. You, quote, I felt so bad because they worked hard to come back. He said, don't worry, I've got your back, Baez. That's what that Baez is. said. <laughs> and then Baez went out and hit a game-winning home run. That's oh, one of those things man. where it's like, when I hear that, I don't even think it's like Javi just being a good teammate, I literally think that Javi's like, no, don't worry, dude, I'll take care of it. Like, and then he just does. That's very, he just like, takes it upon himself to, to do this. Yeah. And it reminds me, the, it reminds me of something where Javi wasn't the one to say it. It was Pedro but, Strope. Yeah. I was yeah. It reminds me of that, Corey, that 2016 God. Homer off yeah. of Cueto where we heard the story afterward. I don't remember if it was in the dugout or back in the locker room between innings where Strope goes up to him and says, literally, you, Javi Baez, need yeah. to take control of this game right now. You need to be the one to do it. And then Javi goes out and hits the game-winning home run, you know, Santa Maria, that whole deal. And he just has a knack for these moments. If you give him the opportunity, he's going to take it. And, like, let's be honest. Did anybody not think he was going to do something big after the Cubs lost that challenge? The Cubs challenged the play that uh, (laughs) Wong was in fair territory when he dropped that ball. They they don't have, for whatever reason, the camera that's, like, straight down the line. I think the, the Fox broadcast was explaining that unless it's the playoffs, they don't have that, which... Good luck explaining that to me. Like these games don't matter, so we can't get the 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 right camera view. Like, what's the point of replaying it then? But I digress. <laughs> uh, but you just have that feeling where you're like, oh, okay, Javi gets another shot here. Like, and you know, he was on second base. It was a little disappointing that they didn't win the challenge. But nobody's mad that Javi gets to take another hack. And, you know, it's just one of those situations where the Cardinals, uh, of course, after the fact, are wishing that they had lost that particular challenge. But yeah, Brendan, like watching him go the other way, the way that he's using the whole field. And he's still is, doing it. Like every at bat, he's going oppo. It's yeah, crazy. It's amazing. And yeah. just looking at his updated stats, he has a 316 batting average, a 411 Woba, a 158 W. 
R, C+, and a 1.004 OPS. Wow. Like I said, guys, uh, 11 home runs, 26 RBIs. This is pretty much a tagline of this show at this point. It's Javi Baez world. We all just live in it. And he's doing, (sighs) you know, we knew that he had a strong arm, but he's continuing to do this thing where he's, and tonight it was Wainwright running. So, you know, obviously a slow runner, but he's throwing guys out from shallow left field on some of these ground balls. He's just showing off the arm. He's showing off who he is, and to kind of wrap up the the El Mago portion of of this podcast, I guess for now, I I will close it by the the quote that he had in the mid game interview that he did with A Rod, recorded before the game, where also like you want to talk about like the the swag that this guy has. He's got you know the the aviator sunglasses on. He's got like five chains going you know, with A-Rod, just like, you I'm saw, not you be... saw what one of those chains was, right? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, basically like, uh, a magician emoji. Mm, yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. That, yeah. That's amazing. No, I didn't notice that, but yeah. he was like, you know, look, I'm doing an interview with A-Rod, but I'm going to way out swag him. That is not even going to be a contest, but A-Rod asks him, do you like playing here? What do you think about playing here long term in the future? And Javi says, I would love to play my whole career here with the Chicago Cubs. Oh you know what, Javi? I love this. I'm man. gonna go out on a limb here and speak for all of Cubs fandom here, which is always a risk because uh yeah, careful. You never want to speak for everybody, but I would like you to be a Cub for life as well, Javi Baez. Uh never leave us, never change. And we're all very glad to be along for this ride because it is uh, extremely fun and entertaining. But I do want to go to uh, another person. Brendan, Just down who, the list. Keep going. Yeah, down the list. Uh, <laughs> who looks like the best version of himself. And I mentioned we this keep a little bit that. in doing the recaps. Uh, but I would like to talk about, through 111 plate appearances, a certain catcher in the National League who has a 311 batting average, a 432 on base percentage, a 678 slugging percentage, good for a 454 Woba. 454, Brendan. A 187 WRC+. Plus. Ladies and gentlemen, Will the real Wilson Contreras please stand up? I, this is ridiculous, it's Brendan. Insane, and he boy. hits another home run on Sunday night, his ninth of the year. And like I said when I was doing the recap, he had 10 home runs last season. I'm not going to make, I don't have any more, you know, chili related diet puns for you uh, if you, you know, came to the podcast for that. But 10 home runs in 544 plate appearances in 2018 with 54 RBIs. Through t- that was 138 games played. Through 28 games played and 100, excuse me, 29 games played and 111 plate appearances. He has nine home runs and 21 RBIs. He is also similar to Chris Bryant, walking at a higher rate than he has in his entire career. Worth noting, in the interest of disclosure, he's also striking out at the highest rate of his career. But, yeah. so what? Yeah. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, right? Like, I'm just throwing it out there. But well, yeah, I get it. this is the best version of Wilson Contreras. And we, when we talked about this all off season, and really, you know, through last season, like, we were expecting big things from this guy. And, you know, we're certainly not alone in, you know, going into this year, knowing that this guy just has better production in him. And that the 2018 season, while there may be, you know, a confluence of factors, right? Like he's, you know, growing into that role as a starting catcher, you know, learning how to catch different pitchers, sometimes difficult pitchers, taking on that heavy burden of of playing more games, growing as an MLB player, growing as a hitter, all doing this at the same time. But we just, you just knew that there was more in there than what we saw from him in the 2018 season. And, you know, he finished, just for comparison, he finished the 2018 season with a 321 Woba and a 100 WRC+. plus. So right exactly at league average. And you just knew that there was more that this guy should be doing and that that was not who he is and who he was going to be. 
and he is blowing anything that I would have even hoped for or asked for. You know, like you were saying with Javi, or asking the baseball gods, you know, please, you know, like, <laughs> let me at least get Javi, you know, at this level, even if I'm not going to ask for the world and, you know, have him, you know, put together another MVP season again, which he is. I, I To be honest with you, I don't think the baseball gods have any control over Javi Baez. I, he might be he the might baseball be the god. Baseball yeah. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think you were speaking to him directly. <laughs> um, but even in like your wildest dreams for Contreras, this is pretty amazing for him. And looking at from a uh, wins above replacement perspective, even coming into Sunday, so before hitting that ninth home run, he had already accumulated 1.1 war on the entire season. Hmm. That's more than the entire season for 2018. That's amazing, Brendan. He is just on one right now. And, you know, similar to Javi, like he's just one of those guys, you just love watching him succeed. He is so joyful and happy yeah. when he does things well on the baseball field the way the, the amount of pride that you know he has in catching Hendricks on Friday not even doing anything at the plate just that he was a part of that for Hendricks and working with Hendricks to accomplish that combine that with what he's doing at the plate it's awesome man oh it's, it's unbelievable I think with with Wilson he and Javi are doing somewhat something similar and both are going to the opposite field with much greater frequency in years past. When Wilson was called up in 2016 and throughout even the 2017 season, he only hit like 21% of his batted balls to the opposite portion of the field. And this year, he's up to over 30%. And it's not as if he's just making weak contact either. He has all the power numbers in the world that makes you believe this is a for real change. And I'm just going to point to his like BABIP because I, I already know. I already know people are going to complain about, well, his BABIP is near 400 or whatever. That's not to say he's getting lucky. Like, like not to go off on a tangent here, but that's, that's my biggest pet peeve. You want a high BABIP because, you know, sometimes one base hits are good, but two, it shows that there are times you're hitting the ball very hard and very well. That's not a bad thing to have a high BABIP. It's a bad thing to have a high BABIP if it's such a deviation from your norm. This could be the new norm for Wilson Contreras in that he's hitting the ball all over the field with authority. And you go look at his expected numbers. His expecting slugging percentage is the best in the league for all catchers. It's better than better than 90% of all hitters in the league. So... If this if this is what Wilson is going to continue to do to go to the opposite field with authority to sacrifice some contact in doing so, which is why he's striking out more, I don't care. Like go for it, Wilson. Like do your thing. And when Joe Madden was being interviewed during the broadcast, he, he was asked, like, what's going on with Wilson here? And Joe said he sees Wilson as having a more quiet approach. His mechanics, his pre-pitch movement. Corey, you've actually, I think, posted about this in great yeah. detail. Wilson is a different guy. He's he's a different guy than last year. He's a different guy than really at any point in this entire year. This is the best version of Wilson Contreras. And so when you see these changes match success, to me, you have more confidence expecting this going forward. And maybe he's not going to be, you know, the same guy the entire year. Cause if he is, he's going to hit 55 to 60 homers. But <laughs> even if you sign me up for that, yeah, seriously sign me up for that. But if he continues to show these trends where he's willing to go to the opposite field with authority, then he's unequivocally the best hitting catcher in the league. And he's unequivocally probably a top 15 20 hitter in the league i mean he's that that would equate to like a 380 400 woba and the crazy part is this is kind of what we expected going into 2018 and we we talked about this with, with michael cerami like i think he and i and, and a lot of people were on board with the fact that if wilson Contreras has this offense as a catcher he's an mvp candidate so you tie this back in. You have Javi Baez. You have Chris Bryant as obvious MVP candidates. But if Wilson Contreras keeps doing this, he leads a major league pitching staff, Corey. He calls the majority of the games. He catches way more innings than your normal catcher. Yeah. That's, call me crazy, that's pretty valuable. That's maybe the most valuable asset you can have in the game right now coming from the catching position. So I'm thrilled. I, it's it's so difficult to pinpoint and just kind of figure out why this team is doing so well. 
it's because everyone is doing so well. And that's that's the cool thing about all of this. Well, Brennan, I mean, next thing you're going to tell me that the Cubs are like a good baseball team or Isn't something. Isn't that crazy? Which, you know, based on the reaction that some had to that one and six start, uh, I, I don't know. And, but I was and, told that that wasn't true. And look, that, so. that one and six start was frustrating. I mean, you and I were frustrated, but we said verbatim. The reason for that frustration was because we know this team has such like greater potential, such right. a higher ceiling. And it's frustrating to see that out of the gate. It wasn't a lack of confidence. I'd, like we never said that. Like we were always remaining positive that this team is going to turn it around and do it relatively quickly. That was never an issue. So I just want to throw it out there. There's a lot of people and fans who genuinely believed that one and six start was a reflection of what's to come the entire year. And if you thought like that, you know, it's, I, I can sort of get it, I think, but nah, yeah, maybe not. not really. Maybe not. When you have this much talent, when you have this quantity of talent, things are sure to work out. It's the way baseball works. And that's why Dakota, it can't handle that much variability, that much quantity of ceiling of potential. And that's why I got that, that win, that terrible win projection of what, 80 games? I mean, come on with 79. that. 79. Come you're, on. You're with too that. high. Yeah. Come on with that. You got to factor in some type of like ceiling into that. They got to fix that model. I don't know what's going on over there. But yeah, Corey, yeah. that's that. I mean, it's hard. Again, it's hard to really emphasize one player in particular when everyone is doing the same thing. Right. So, but with that said, I do want to turn uh, to one Tony Rizzo because, you know, just because like Chris Bryant, you know, he got off to the slow start and, you know, attention was certainly paid to that slow start of his and, you know, watching him kind of creep back up there. And boy, has he done that, folks. Uh Eight home runs now, 25 RBIs on the season, uh, a 12.1% walk rate, 14.2% K rate, a 241 average, 369 OBP, 526 slugging, a 377 Woba, and a 135 WRC plus. And, you know, like, again, the, the average will creep up there. That's that's not where that's going to finish or where you would expect Anthony to be. Uh, but these other numbers are you know, have very quickly kind of fallen in line. And he just, you know, looks like Rizzo. And, you know, he hits that bomb on Friday that was, you know, kind of the uh, the starting shot in, in a Cubs-Cardinals series, which is, you know, always great to see when, you know, your guy, like that guy in the lineup, Rizzo, goes out there and gets things going for you. And there, there you know, I don't know with him that, you know, like with some of these other guys, you can kind of dig into like new things that they're doing or ways that they're like taking themselves to a separate level. And, you know, Rizzo is kind of different in the regard that he's just really freaking good. And he kind of just does that year in and year out. And despite the slow start, we're, you know, looking at him on his way to another season's worth of that. Yeah, Rizzo's one of those guys too. You just trust. And I, this is like third episode we've done this, but he's the model of consistency. Every single year, he's around 30 homers. He's going to strike out at the same rate. He's going to walk. He's just, there's never a question of Rizzo's ability to turn it on. Just at some point, you expect the numbers to normalize. He's that anchor in your lineup. He's the one guy who you know he's going to give you that quality at bat. He just falls into that, those same Ben Zobris, those veteran hitters, those guys who can grind out quality at bats, even if you don't get the results. And that, yeah, like you were saying, the, the first homer in that series, that three-run shot, got things going. It set the tone. And Tony kind of did the same thing in that final game where he had that two-run double to bring back those two runs that Q gave up to make it a 3-2 game. Tony puts him back up to 5-2. And that's what you want from your captain, your guy who can step up in those situations and give the team a quality at bat that translates to success. And it's scary. We go through these names. We talk about Wilson. We talk about Javi, Chris Bryant, you know, even Jason Hayward at times. And whether it's good or bad, Rizzo is sometimes the forgotten guy in that group. And he himself, the 30-plus homer potential, a guy can hit 300. You put him in that, that lineup every single day in that three spot. We, maybe not we, maybe I, maybe I take that for granted. That's 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 exactly what you hope and you dream of having a player in your lineup capable of doing. And he's your, he's your anchor, man. And going one to eight, you know, you can slot in whoever you want in that leadoff spot. You can finish off your six, seven, eight slots. But if we're going to go into this 
rest of the season with Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, Javi Baez, Wilson Contreras in your top five. You know, we can mix and match with Wilson in that five spot. That's a hell of a lineup. I, I, No one in the National League has that lineup, and the numbers are showing that right now. But really, honestly, this offense, I, it's... Maybe I'm just a little bit too hyped up right now, but it almost seems more lethal than 2016. I don't know if I'm crazy or whatever, but it just seems like anyone, top to bottom, can put up massive amount of runs, Corey. It's 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 wild, it's insane, it's whatever you want to call it. I feel good. I feel phenomenal that this offense is reaching their potential, and I don't want to be too greedy asking the baseball gods for this to happen, but deep down inside, I thought this might and could happen, and it's just so, so refreshing to see everyone successfully adapt, and that's, that's it's it's just fun to watch. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, I, I, I haven't dug into the numbers. We did read that stat line uh, from our friend Aaron Kennelly the last time that kind of compared that they were very close and in a lot of ways putting up better, you know, kind of slash numbers than the 2016 offense. But like, I haven't dug in and like compared it exactly. But the one thing I, I go back to is something you said earlier in this podcast, which was on Saturday when they go down five to one, yeah. you do not have that feeling like you did, especially in the second half last year, where you're like, oof, like over. they got to score six to win right. this game. Like I just don't, you know, deep down, I just don't think that's going to happen. And, you know, they, we, we, you know, talked ad nauseum about uh, what was it, the 40 games that they scored one or zero runs and, you know, that whole spiel. But th- that was the 2018 Cubs that are dead and gone now. But that's the key for me is that you just genuinely have that feeling, you know, as all of us watch all these games and, you know, obsess on this team religiously, you, you know, you started kind of start to develop that feel for what's going on with them. And on Saturday, you're like, yeah, it's five to one. You know, just try to like, Come back. you know, stop the bleeding there. And it's, you know, what was it? The fourth inning when they went down five to one? Like there's plenty of time for this group. <laughs> like Javi still got at least what? Three, four at bats in this game, depending on how things yeah, go. Maybe like one no, or two homers. On. There's, you never there's know. plenty of time here. <laughs> so that to me is the key. Uh, two more notes on the offense and then then we'll move to the pitching. I know we're running long here, but like I said, the hype train's in overdrive, folks. So I told you to buckle your seatbelt for a reason. Um, I did just want to point out one thing on KB. Uh, he has reached base in 15 straight games after Sunday. So even, and, and this is something we talked about, like even when he wasn't putting up those numbers, he's extremely productive. This is not one of those guys who like when he's in a slump, he has no value at the plate. And he's long out of this slump at this point. But I think it it does a good job to illustrate, like, getting on base in 15 straight games is not easy. And he just has that ability to, you know, whether he's going right or not, he will he will be a factor in some way, right? And I do just want to read this quote because I, I, I like the way it ends uh, from KB on the post one and six Cubs, and this is from Jesse Rogers at ESPN. Quote, we really turned it around since then. Our pitchers have been great. Our at-bats have been great. Defense, everything has really been clicking for us. This is the type of baseball that's super fun to be a part of. And really, I just wanted to read that so that I could agree and say, you know what, Chris, this is super fun. I agree. That's the perfect way to describe (laughs) the way the Cubs have been playing Super fun, fun. is you know just all there is to say. But I want to turn to the pitching for a little bit, and you know it's it's uh, been very good on the whole. And I'm going to read this tweet from again Jordan Bastian, and he said that the Cubs rotation had a 6.52 ERA through the team's first 11 games. The group has since spun a 2.49 ERA, 34 earned runs allowed in 123 innings pitched over the last 20 games. Mm. Boy, Oof, is that, that really good. We needed that. And like I said, I honestly, I don't have the energy to dig into Darvish on Saturday. It wasn't good. <laughs> I mean, that's that's really all there is. Like he doesn't have any clue where the ball is going in some of these starts and it just wasn't good. Like, so uh, that's what it is. I don't even know if there's anything else to analyze, but right now he's the fifth starter in this group. And we're just seeing some unbelievable performances from the guys around him. And, you know, you look at that start from Lester in Seattle, where he was dominant in that game. Obviously, Hendricks on Friday. Jose Quintana has just straight up been on one, folks. I mean, this is the pitcher that the Cubs traded for. Um, 
Step in the I believe he has a 1.93 ERA in his last six starts. I'll confirm that when I let Brendan start talking, but I believe I read that in a tweet uh, earlier. We've seen Cole Hamels, you know, throw, uh, you know, shutout innings throughout this year. And, you know, even when he hasn't been at his best, he's still delivering winnable, you know, good starts for this team. This this rotation has has really you know for the most part rounded into form uh, and it's it, look for me like obviously I could talk about John Lester all day all night he didn't even pitch in this series I I could still figure out a way <laughs> to spend most of the podcast talking about him but Brennan like the story continues to be one Jose Quintana and another big effort from him tonight. Uh, and the the key, the, the, one of the biggest things for me tonight, this Cardinals lineup has a lot of guys that have hit him very well. The ESPN broadcast pointed it out. And of course, you know, it's not the largest sample size with some of these guys. You know, it's like five to nine at bats for some of these guys. But, you know, there was a game in 26, uh, 2017, I think, where Goldschmidt on the Diamondbacks took him deep twice in one game. I know Osuna has done well against him, etc. And he goes out there and he delivers a really good start to keep the, you know, the good vibes of this team rolling. And really, like, we've seen Almora make plays on balls similar to that one that I think hits the basket for Molina. That's the, you know, how the Cardinals get their runs off of Quintana. So, you know, he's like a couple inches. I guess you could say he's a couple inches from giving up a three-run home run at the same time. But he's also, you know, a couple inches from Al making a, a play that we've seen him make that, you know, makes us all go, wow, uh, before. And he's, you know, that close to really getting out of this unscathed. And he's, again, now 4-1 and one on the year. Um, he's started six games. He's gone 39 and two-thirds innings in those games. He's got a 9.08K per nine. 2.5 walk per nine, good for a 3.4 ERA and a 3.59 FIP on the year. He just looks great, man. Yeah, uh, I, I got to say, the last two years, I've been disappointed at times with with Q. Not to say that he's been bad because he's been basically league average. This Wait, year, our, some- our listeners know about the Brendan Bowl. <laughs> you know the, 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 the Jose Quintana of- Johulis Chasin starts. They know <laughs> that, that will forever go down in uh, podcast history. But 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 seriously, th- there were times where you 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 always have the idea in the back of your head that you gave up Eloy Jimenez and Dylan Cease for for Jose Quintana, and you kind of just expected a little bit more. And again, it's not that he was bad, but th- this year it's it it feels different and maybe it's because he was mic'd up and like grunting after every pitch today maybe that was it but I, I really think there's a mental shift I don't know what it is but his command has been so dang good these last few starts and what I love most about the start against the Cardinals on Sunday is his velocity never deviated as the game went on in fact I love this his very last fastball of the game was over like 92 miles per hour. So he just stayed consistent all the way through, even during jams. And I was watching a game with my brother and I, and I mentioned this to him. I'm like, you know what? Like, even though the, the Cardinals are putting up quality at bats, that's not an indictment on Q. He's hitting his spots. Go look back at where Wilson's setting up. He's hitting his spots. He's making his pitches. I'm, Really surprised, Corey, that that he's doing this, that he's stepping up in these situations. And I know we all knew we had the potential to do so, but there came a point where I not I didn't give up on on Q. I just kind of gave Hendricks and Lester that confidence, that confidence. I don't know this is my confidence in those two guys only, and to have Q come back and to show that he's basically almost looking like the same guy. From those White Sox days, it's it's insane. It's like, what do we do to deserve this? To get all these guys back on track and clicking at the same time. But for Q, uh, we sat through the 2018 second half, Brendan. That's what we did to deserve okay. it. Okay, we know what. If that's what it took to get these guys back, then that's a worthy sacrifice, in my opinion. But we sat through that tiebreaker and the wild uh, card game. Well, you to did. Answer you your did question there. Is, you did is there what we person. did. Uh, terrible. But I I, I want to mention the bullpen too. I, do you have anything yes. else to add to the rotation? Can I go to the bullpen? No. But like, can I start with this stat? Okay, you can start with the stat. 
thank you. Uh, so this was actually from this morning, so it does not include this evening, but I think that's mostly fine because those Chatwood runs are, you know, kind of throwaways in a what started as a 13-2 game when he came in. So this is from uh, Bleacher Nation, Brett over at Bleacher Nation, and he looked at the splits of major league bullpens since April 7th, which is the date we saw, uh, I think that's the day that that Brewers series ends, and we saw a lot of that reshuffling, like with Edwards and some of those other moves, kind of to start the Cubs moving those pieces around for the first time during the year. Since April 7th, the Cubs have nearly been a full run better than any other bullpen in the league. In 73 and two-thirds innings, again, before Sunday night's game, they had a 1.83 ERA since April 7th. So that is nearly a month of bullpen baseball. And Brett does point out in a subsequent tweet that, you know, you, you the, the reason that they've been able to throw less innings than a lot of these bullpens is the aforementioned starting group has been very, very good. But you want to talk about like a drastic change, Brendan. And to be fair, this is kind of what we said in those early episodes. That was pretty much our only thing with the team. We were never doubtful of this team's ability or, or questioning our belief in them in the long run. But it was the, the the basic sentiment was you you do need to like stop blowing games where you're <laughs> scoring ten runs. Like that has to stop, and you need to be committed to moving the pieces around and giving guys different roles until it stops. And they have done that, man. And like yeah. that number is crazy. A, a 1.83 ERA in 73 and two thirds innings. Uh, this is that, I mean, uh, it's quite go. a turnaround. It's a huge turnaround. And okay. So like, who do we attribute the turnaround to in the bullpen? There's a few guys. One yes. is Pedro Strope. And I want to read this because it gets me pumped up. Pedro Strope Three of every four appearances, he comes into the game, he's going to throw a first pitch strike, Corey. He comes into the game four times, three of those times, first pitch strike. That is better than 95% of major league relievers. Not only that, we know, we know all about the Cubs' walk issues. To have your closer be the guy to come in to throw strikes, I don't need to tell you how alleviating that is for us psychologically. That is a huge deal. And Strobe is forming really into kind of a, a viable top of the league closer. And he's always been good. We've always read the numbers, but that's been in kind of like a sixth, seventh, and at times eighth inning role. And it's not that that is a bad thing. The Cubs have had better more historically great closers with your, you know, the likes of Chapman and so on. So we get it. But around the league, there is this bullpen issue where half the league is, or not half the league, but ERA is half a point up for all major league bullpens this year. And that's that's kind of weird to, to justify why, but that's what we're seeing. Strope is your model of consistency. So Strope's number one. Number two, Brandon Kinsler, dude. Like, yep. um, what like what is going on there? I don't understand that. I, I he he made me nauseous the entire off season because he he held up that five million that I thought could have spent or could have elsewhere. been spent elsewhere to get a you know a better reliever. So that that was kind of a frustrating point for me. He has shoved this year, Corey. Yes. He is not walking anyone. His grounder rate is above sixty percent. He's barely given up any runs. He's been your stop gap guy in some situations. So he's number two. Number three is Kyle freaking Ryan yeah. Corey. His numbers are insane. I want to read them right now. His K per nine. Are you ready for this? His K per nine in 11 and two thirds innings is 12.34. 12.34. His walk per nine is under four. It's 3.86. It's essentially league average. His FIP is one. Point six eight. His grounder rate is 57%. This is a guy who has a release point further to first base than any single left-handed reliever in the game. No one else throws with that unique of a release point that far off to the first base side. 
he only throws 88, 89, 90. And I've watched games with casual fans. They're like, who is this guy? He can only throw 90 miles per hour and using him in, in this situation. You're seeing why. Because he's he's letting go of the ball at an angle most hitters have never seen before. 12.34K per nine, Corey, in 11 innings. He's becoming a guy Joe can rely on. Absolutely. Not only against lefties, but in general to go in and get outs against lefties, righties late in the game. So, you know, fast forward from where we were a few weeks ago. I hope just one guy, just one guy would have panned out. And what we're seeing right now is we're looking at Kyle Ryan step up massively. We're looking at Brandon Kinsler stepping up massively. Pedro Strope has been the same guy he's always been as a closer now. They have three viable relievers. They have a rotation that's going deep into games. This is a winning formula. It's not surprising they've done so well, but I don't want to underemphasize what Kyle Ryan and Kinsler has done. Because quite honestly, if I had to pick one guy to explain the turnaround, I probably would flip a coin between Kinsler and Ryan. But I really think it is Ryan. I think he's kind of been a nice uh, path to to Pedro Strope that Joe has been using. It's been so fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. I think those two are definitely key. I, I'll, I'll note that Brad Brock has has definitely settled down since the beginning of the season yeah. where he had a couple bad outings. Uh, you know, after Saturday's game, he doesn't pitch on Sunday. A 2.77 ERA on the season for him. He's done a nice job that outing on Saturday. He goes two-thirds of an innings, no hits, no walks, and two strikeouts. So that's been good. You know, Steve Ciszek, uh has been you know mostly himself he's had a, a little bouts of command perhaps I'm not worried you know, about dealing him, no I was just gonna yeah. say perhaps you know he's been used a lot by the Cubs since they got him uh so there's you know gonna be stretches where he's he's not uh someone who you can literally pitch every day and just expect <laughs> to get out of every situation but he has still been good strope has been strope as he always is just really good throwing, you know, just nasty stuff. But yeah, I mean, look, I it's, I think it's a take your pick between Kyle Ryan and Brandon Kinsler. I, I'm going to go with Kinsler only just because <laughs> I think it does speak a little bit to what we were saying in those early series. And I remember in those first couple series pointing out like, look, you, you can't keep blowing these games, right? And you need to start giving guys the opportunity to earn more playing time, earn those higher leverage spots. And one of the only guys in the early going of the season that was doing that was Brandon Kinsler. And I remember saying, like, I never would have imagined being in this position, you know, coming into the year after watching him for the Cubs in 2018. But this guy is earning those spots and keep giving them to to him, him until he gives you a reason not to. And he's just p- continued to be very good. Like you said, that ground ball rate is, uh, you know, near 60%. Like, he just looks good. And, you know, honestly, like, some of the only times he seems to get bit is Joe leaves him in a little too long, just tries to squeeze a little too much out of him. Uh, but otherwise, he's just been really good. But, yeah, I mean, Kyle Ryan, I mean, you you, you got to give props filthy, there. Man. A guy that I don't think, uh, you know, anyone was necessarily expecting to play the role that he has. But, yeah, dude, it's, it's a credit to this group. It's a credit to uh, Tommy Hadovy. And, uh, you know, again, I think a credit to the, the decision makers of this team in, you know, recognizing that same thing that, that, that we were, we and others were saying in those early series, like you cannot, we knew that this had the potential to be an area of concern and you can't keep throwing some of these games away. Your offense, even in the beginning portion of the season, was doing great work. And, you know, in that early stretch, they lost, what, two games where they scored 10 runs or more? Like, that can't happen. And they didn't waste any time. You know, they, they took a guy in Carl Edwards, for example, who has been a part of this team for years now, and they gave him you know, a couple last shots and then said, that's it, dude. Like, we don't have time for this. Like, By the we are way, going he's done to give very other well people these done... opportunities and we are going to try to figure this out as quickly as we can. And that's the, their reward is that number that I read from Bleacher Nation, a, a 1.83 ERA uh, since April 7th. Again, not including Sunday's game. The split stats don't update until the next day. So we can't really uh, provide <laughs> that right now, but I'm sure it's pretty similar. You guys get the idea. So, yeah, man. Uh, I, I, 
I, I think that kind of <laughs> takes us through everything. Um, it, this was an incredible series, man. I, I do, as we're wrapping up here, want to give one more nod, you know, just because we only really mentioned it in the recap, but that's a huge moment for Taylor Davis on Saturday. Yeah, and it's one of those man. moments that I think as we go down the year here, like even, you know, as we expect bigger and better things to keep coming for this team, that's going to be, you know, a top of the highlight reel moment, uh, no doubt. Like really, no matter how this, the rest of the season plays out, that'll be in there because against the Cardinals and, you know, like you said, it's just one of those games that gives you that special feeling about a team when they're able to pull stuff like that off. And that was the next half inning from them falling down 5-2. to two. The You know, the card score in the second, third, and then they put up the three spot in the fourth. But they didn't, the Cubs don't waste any time. They immediately get a couple guys on and take advantage of it. And, you know, that's just one of those things where they just have that attitude, like, we are not messing around. Like, we are going to rectify this stuff quick. And that's just, you know, it is it it is what, you know, kind of builds that special feeling uh, with a team like this. So, I, that, that's, that's pretty much where I am. I think yeah, it's pretty simple. Like we said in the outset, like this team is 19 and 12 after starting one and six and then ultimately going to two and seven as well. That is an incredible turnaround and to blow past everybody in this NL Central to be in sole possession of first place as we record this on Sunday night. And if you guys are listening to this on Monday morning, uh, that should still be the case, uh, as the Cubs don't play until Monday night. But, the best win percentage in the National League, Brennan, and, you know, granted, this is like two percentage points uh, over, I think, the the LA Dodgers, and obviously the Cardinals were just in first place, so you're very close with them, but it's it's not so much about, you know, sort of like flexing your muscles, saying like, oh, we're the best team in the National League. It's about recognizing how quickly this group has turned that around. I, I really don't think that that can be overstated, like how quickly they erased that bad start to not only get themselves back in the thick of the division, but to be sitting on top of it on on May 5th is is really impressive. And it just speaks to the character, the mindset, and the drive of this team. It's it's one of those things where you look at and you heard them all off season talk about how hungry they were, how urgent they wanted to be, and how pissed they were at the way the 2018 season ended. And I, I you know, I don't think that there's a better way to show that than responding to a, a rocky start and saying this is not going to be our fate. This is not who we are. And we're going to prove that really quickly. Yeah, man. I, I Look, again, I'm still surprised that it took them this short to get back into the thick of things. And that's not as a bad thing that, that reflects poorly on the Cubs. It's just how baseball works. But they've just been fire ever since. Okay. So let's review this upcoming series against, you're ready for this, the Miami Marlins. They will be coming to Wrigley Field for not three games, but four games. So the Cubs have a beautiful opportunity to continue this winning streak. Okay, so on the on Monday at 7.05 p.m., we'll begin the first game of the four-game set. Uh, Cole Hamels will take the mound for the Cubs with a 3-0 and record, a 3.19 ERA. He'll be facing Sandy Alcantara, who's 1-3 with a 4.86 ERA. And then on Tuesday, same start time at 7.05 p.m., Caleb Smith for the Marlins will take the mound with a 3-0 record and a 2.00 ERA. John Lester will oppose him with a 2.1 and a 1.73 ERA. Wow, Corey, 1.73. Very nice there. Caleb Smith is tough. I think he's probably the nastiest arm in that rotation, just lethal secondary stuff. So you may not have heard about him, but I think he has just disgusting stuff. Okay, on the third game of the set, on Wednesday, Kyle Hendricks will return to the mound to follow up that stellar 81 pitch outing against the Cardinals. He'll be facing Jose Urania. Urania is a 1 in 5 with a 5.45 ERA. Hendricks, after that beautiful start, is now sitting at a 2 and 4 record and a 3.93 ERA. Again, that game starts at 7.05 p.m. Central Time. And then to finish off the four game set on Thursday, they'll, they'll be back at it at 1.20 p.m. 
they'll have you Darvish take the mound, who is two and three with a 5.79 ERA, looking to just own in on that fastball command. He was talking to the media about how he wants to throw in some more sinkers. So look for that, I guess, in his next start. He'll be facing Richards. For Miami, who is 0-4 with a 4.10 ERA, the Marlins are as bad as you think. They're 9-24, dead last in the East. The Cubs sit 19-12, first place in the NL Central, as we keep mentioning. Half a game up on the Cardinals. Cubs also having the best record by winning percentage in the National League. Again, this is May 5th. It's wild that they're even here. What I'm looking for in this series is just continuing, honestly, the good vibes, seeing everyone top to bottom put up good at-bats. In particular, I'm looking how they're going to fill in for one Daniel Descalso, who's been experiencing ankle soreness. He was removed in that second game against the Cardinals. Not too much follow-up there. The good news, I guess, is that he's not on the injured list yet. So I'm assuming the severity of the injury is not too high. Yeah, but they we'll be- said he could have pinch hit on Sunday, okay. but obviously they scored enough runs right. that that wasn't necessary. Right. So it may go as the Cubs trying to just give him more rest, and that means more David Bodie. Perhaps we'll see. We'll see what happens there. So again, the, the the main thing for me is just continuing the good at bats. If there's one thing in particular, it is you Darvish. I keep saying it. I don't want this to turn into the weekly you Darvish. Like that's what I'm looking for. Better command, but that is <laughs> what I'm looking for. And I think if if the sinker thing is a formidable change that will get him over the top, then I'm all for it. So I'm all for him trying to go out there and you know try new things at this point because whatever he's been doing with the fastball command. Not working, Corey. Anything that I'm missing that you're looking for? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I mean, look, like we've said before, this team is just playing extraordinary baseball right now, and you want to keep that going. Uh, but they did incredible work to get to this point, and they are on one right now. And I, you know, I certainly, it's hard not to look at a series with the Marlins at home, a team who you swept in Miami. And not kind of, you know, start thinking like, I wouldn't mind an 11 game winning streak. I'm certainly not going to complain about it. But, you know, I, I try to never demand a sweep of anyone, especially in a four game series. Um, but it, you know, it is easy when it's the Marlins to kind of let your mind wander there. And then obviously you're going to welcome uh, the Brewers to Wrigley, you know, for the first time this season. So that's always, you know, something to look at. So, you know, you don't want to get caught looking ahead. You don't want to get caught taking a team like Miami lightly because you did sweep them uh, in their own ballpark. But like you said, I mean, this is a bad team and the Cubs are playing, you know, basically the best baseball in the league right now over the, this this recent stretch. So, you know, you just hope they, they keep their foot on the gas, that that has been their motto all off season and, and that that's what they wanted to do. And I think, you know, this is one of those areas where, you know, obviously, again, you've done great work to get back to this point. I think this is one of those areas where you prove it, where you say, yeah, we have done great work. We now have sole possession of first place. And, it's still only May 5th. Like we're not, we're not content yet. Like we've got a long season to go and we are going to keep our foot on that gas all the way down. Like until we have won this division, until we're winning in the playoffs and until we've won the world series. So that's, uh, you know, pretty much the plan. I mean, like you, I mean, yeah, that that's there, there's, uh, you know, one guy really in this rotation that has not kind of joined the rest of the party, uh, you know, so to speak, and that's Darvish. I was really hoping that he would be able to build on that quality start against the Diamondbacks uh, and the fact that he was able to overcome the spotty command without, uh, you know, any damage against him, uh, and he wasn't able to do that. And I, I think the most frustrating part of his outing was that he walks the first two batters after Taylor Davis hits a grand slam. And, you know, man, is that frustrating. Uh, I'm not, you know, going to turn the end of this podcast into like a vent about you uh, portion, but that's so frustrating, man. Like your backup catcher hits a grand slam to tie it against the Cardinals, get you back in the game. And it's one thing if like, you know, the next guy comes up and hits a home run, but you're just going to walk two people man, is that frustrating. So 
Yeah, it's it's at the same time frustrating, you know, that again, we're we're long past the point of like silver linings. And you know, you read so many of the the, the columns and articles from from the various outlets and and papers and blogs and whatever, and they all kind of have the same tone every time. Like well, it wasn't great, but this was good, I guess, or like, you know, <laughs> yeah. this part was good and maybe he can build on that. And, you know, it, it you're, you're just past that. Like you, you do need results at some point, right? We can't just always be kind of picking through the data to say, well, this is good. His velo was good or this pitch was good. He should throw that more. Like you need just straight up results at some point, and he's got to deliver that. But again, like right now, he finds himself slotted in terms of output and performance as a fifth starter in this rotation. And there's worse spots to be in with your fifth starter uh, than more with you, Darvish. Darvish because again, and you know, like that's where I think you are able to try and be optimistic and look at these little things and say, look, we've got four other guys who are you know, dealing, you know, for the most part, uh, in, in different degrees and different respects in, in, in terms of each of them. But these four guys like seem to be pretty comfortable in doing what they're doing. You kind of like have an idea of what they're going to be doing for you. They're pitching well. And if you're able to say like, okay, like if he does get this fastball command or does figure out a way to do the sequencing that he's able to harness that command, like he's pumping gas. We know his pitches move like crazy. If you can figure it out, right? And, and get him to get going. You know, now you've got a one through five rotation that is just absolute nails. Like, good luck to everybody, What's right? your confidence so, in you, Darvish, though? Like, like, like genuinely asking here, do you, like, what's your confidence in him? Honestly, I have no idea. I, I couldn't put a number on it because I, I really was hoping that he, he, that, that, that Saturday would be like His that moment. big start for him. He was coming off a, a good outing and, a, a, you know, a quality start by the definition against the Diamondbacks. And, you know, especially after Hendricks on Friday and Lester in that last game in Seattle, you're thinking like the bar has been raised, like go out there and jump over it. You like, this is your start. Like the Cardinals at home at Wrigley Field, like go out there and dominate them. And this is going to be like that you Darvish Cubs start that just, you know, sends him down that path. I really was hoping for that. And it's, you know, it's just not what happens. So it's uh, frustrating, but I honestly, I don't have a number for you. I, it's, it's hard to, to put a thing on because, you know, again, like there, there's just, th- this team is rolling in a way right now where I honestly, like, I just don't have the energy for it. I'm, I'm rooting for him. I hope he's able to figure it out. But I, I, I don't have the mental energy to make it a priority right now. Like the, the team is just doing too, too well uh, around him uh, that I, I, I can't, like, I, I can't delve into this, uh, you know, every time he's out there or every time we <laughs> podcast. So I, I, I'm rooting for him. I hope he turns it around. Uh, but other than that, like, I, I, you know, what else is there to say really? Right. You, ha- I mean, you have to imagine that he's going to get back on track. And the only reason I say that is because pitchers who decline, they do so because their stuff starts to deteriorate. You Darvish was throwing 98 yeah, against the no, Cardinals. It's there. Yeah. What is going on? Why has all of a sudden the command escaped him? And why is it only on the fastball? So in my mind, I, I am I am watching that closely, Corey, because it is a big deal in that if he is back to the same level he was with Texas and with LA for that short stretch, th- this team is crazy, insanely yeah. like <laughs> unbelievably good. So yeah, I am I'm I am still watching that. I'm not saying oh, you know, it's it's vital for their success because at this point, if this is what the rotation is, it's not as urgent as I imagine it would be going into the year. Right. But it's icing on the cake. At yeah, this it takes point. things to a different level. Yeah, yeah sure. And my, my confidence in you, Darvish, I think is, I, I still have high confidence in the guy. I, I, I do. I think it's it's a little bit different than pitchers in years past with the Cubs who have kind of declined. And even Arietta, to some degree, we, we, we know he was still good before he left the Cubs, but he was never the same guy in 2014, 2015, and 2016, or early 2016. And that's because his velocity decreased like two and a half miles per hour. I mean, even today with Philly, he's become exclusively a sinker contact guy, like Derek Lowe almost, sort of, sort of, honestly. So for you, Darvish, he's still the same guy in terms of stuff. It's just, I don't understand why he can't like quite literally throw strikes anymore. 
So once he does figure that out, I I mean, the sky is the limit. He's going to turn back into that same guy. It's not the same thing as Chatwood either, by the way, because Chatwood always had control issues. You Darvish for many years had walk rates three and under for 200 innings. So they're going to figure that out. I, I, I just think that. I think if he's healthy for an entire five, six-month season, if he has a walk rate of six by October, I'm going to be shocked. I think a lot of guys, a lot of fans would be shocked if you Darvish continues to do this. But I, I hear you. It's icing not the cake at this point. It's not as urgent, but it does provide depth. And there might be times during the year where we wish we had you Darvish step up because maybe Q goes through a funk or maybe Hendricks goes through another funk. And you know what, you know what I'm getting at? So it is, mm-hmm. it is important. I'm not saying you don't think it's important, but I, for me, it's very important. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, we, we do have like Mike Montgomery has looked very good in his rehab. He's thrown some really good outings there. Xavier Cedeno, uh, you know, continuing his rehab. So, the, you know, there's still other guys that, that may join this pitching staff, you know, or at least provide uh, some more options for this team. So, you know, that's a good thing too, with how good this bullpen has been, you know, you still have guys who you may be able to work into the fold and, uh, you know, give some of those guys a break or, you know, if guys get hurt or, you know, their performance goes down, you know, you do still have depth around this organization, uh, to, you know, hopefully be able to continue the, uh, the, the good, the good trend here for everything. So I think that's all we have. Uh, they, there's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's really not fun. that much to say. I mean, this this was an amazing series. This was uh, a boatload of fun. Like Chris Bryant said, it was super fun, super, super fun, guys, to watch. And, you know, you just, this is one of the, those, I think, instances as a fan, you just have to tip your cap to this group. They, they had a big series coming in. We're all dreaming of the sweep so that they, you know, we can go to sleep uh, on Sunday night with the Cubs in first place. And, you know, they come out and they, they're on fire, man. So it's it's a fun time to be watching this team, and it does have that vibe where you know now as as we we're getting into uh, you know the heart of the season here as as we move through May, you know this team just gives you that vibe of like you know buckle up, folks. Like it's going to be a special one. Like they they just have that feel, and you know I think to be able to recognize how talented this group is, how well they're playing this early in the season, it, it lets you kind of look and be like, all right, it's going to be a fun summer. Like this is going to be a fun group. They're, they're an amazing group to watch. We hear these stories about how, you know, connected and, and, and good this clubhouse is and just the vibe of everything. It's going to be, it's going to be a fun time. And, uh, I, you know, similar to what you were talking about earlier, Brendan, I am, you know, more than fine if we have a problem of which person on the Cubs we want to like submit as the MLB MVP <laughs> by the time the season ends. I think that's a pretty good problem to have. So, you know, sign me up for that. But we will, of course, talk to you guys on, uh, we'll record on Thursday evening when the Cubs are finished with the Miami Marlins. Uh, hopefully we're talking about an 11 game winning streak, but Again, you know, that's that that is at times a lot to ask. Uh, so hopefully they're, uh, you know, at the very least able to keep the winning ways going. We will talk to you uh, Thursday night. You'll you'll hear it on Friday morning uh, and we will get you ready for uh, a visit from the uh, team from Milwaukee. And uh, other than that, as always, you can find me. I'm at CF Cubs related on Twitter. Brendan is at Cubs related. That is also our Instagram handle, but I am the one that runs that. You can find uh, mostly Brendan's work, but I post things. Basically, I just load videos into articles, and uh, I get a byline for that, so that's cool. Uh, At CubsInsider.com, the handles for that particular website are at RealCubsInsider on both Twitter and Instagram. Those are also uh, run by me, so if you're yelling at those accounts or sending mean things in the DMs. Uh, It's not Brendan you're yelling at, so maybe reconsider that. But other than that, uh, as always, we thank you guys for listening. Uh, you know, these are those moments where it's uh, a lot of fun to do the podcast after the Cubs sweep the Cardinals and get themselves back into first place. Uh, and we're able to do that because of you guys. So we thank you guys for listening, tuning in uh, for two episodes a week, interacting with us on social media, etc. cetera. Uh, we are very grateful for that. So, so thank you. And, you know, we hope you guys, as always, enjoy the show. So again, we will talk to you after the Cubs finish up with the Miami Marlins. 
Marlins, uh, and whether we are figuring out how to get through a one and six stretch together, or we are talking about the first place best win percentage in the National League, Chicago Cubs. Go Cubs. <laughs> 